started a little introduction to future tense. Some of you may know who we are, others probably are new to this. So, uh, welcome, we're really happy to have you. Thank you for waking up on a really nice Saturday morning. I would much rather be in bed myself, but I'm, I promise it's going to be anyway. Uh, so, who is future tense? So, we're basically trying to build a community, a uh, multidisciplinary design community. Uh, because we've realized that that is something that is uh, solely missing in the industry right now. Our uh, goal is to really uh, is to learn from each other, collaborate, and open opportunities to co-create as well. Uh, we do this through a series of meetups, workshops, and design cons. Uh, so far, we've talked to the meetups and the workshops part of it. The design cons will come. Uh, you can find us at Future Tense Inc. on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, we're also on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, more importantly, we recently launched a Facebook group. Uh, this is actually a result of talking to a lot of members of our community who would like to stay in touch with, with each other post meetup as well. And so we we, uh, we put together a Facebook group called the Future Tense Inc. community uh, where we are essentially trying to kind of build this diverse network that can actually help each other out. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to post there. I'm sure people will answer and we as a community know, uh, we as the founders know kind of who is in the community. So we will be happy to kind of uh, help you reach people as well. Do uh, you know, Facebook posts, tweet, Instagram during the session as well. Uh, we love uh, having more and more people know about us because the idea is not only to build a community of designers, uh, the idea is to actually bring in more voices because uh, the design community is very small uh, and we want actually other people to engage with designers to broaden the scope of what we do and how we do it. Uh, so far we've had a few meetups uh, since early 2017. Uh, we've had workshops. Uh, our last meetup was in March when we had Monica who is a, a world builder. She works with Sci-Fi Studios, uh, sorry, Hollywood Studios to build Sci-Fi worlds. Uh, that was a really interesting session. Hopefully at some point we will get our act together, edit that video and put it up for you guys to view online. So bear with us, we're still learning how to edit videos. Uh, the we are always looking for volunteers to help us. Yeah, if you, if you know video editing and want to volunteer your uh, skills, please let us know. And we'll be more than happy to take you up on it. Uh, Feature Dance Inc. is based on two primary aspects of frameworks of design, which is human-centered design and speculative design or design fiction. Uh, our goal really is to combine these two to build more sustainable and inclusive futures. And so hopefully you guys can co-create those with us. Uh, for, um, I mean, is everyone familiar with what design thinking or human centered design is? Uh, just to give you a sense, human centered design is starting from the problem and then going to a solution rather than what we currently do, which is build a solution and then find the problem that it solves. Uh, so that essentially is human centered design. Uh, design fiction is actually quite familiar, but not most. Most people know it as science fiction. Uh, very popular in pop culture, uh, where basically we are prototyping possible futures. Uh, uh, it's also what they call critical design that questions social and ethical implications of emerging technologies. Uh, this was a definition created by the what I've called some of the key founders of speculative design as a practice, that is Anthony Dunn and Fiona Levy. Uh, and on that note, I'd like you to, uh, to introduce Ayaz. Ayaz has been kind enough to also spend his Saturday with us and tell us about some of the really interesting work that they're doing at the Bus Ride Design Lab, uh, the Bus Ride Labs in Goa. Uh, and this topic is engaging with time, where people will tell us about speculative projects that they're working on where they're looking at both speculative costs to inform the future and uh, I will let him tell you. Hello, yeah, uh, so something like Master said, apologies for the Saturday and uh, the order. <laughs> uh, 
So yeah, like Matsi said, apologies for Saturday bringing everyone out. Uh, but certainly, uh, it's a great opportunity for us uh, uh, to kind of share things that we actually felt nobody else so was interested in. Uh, so this kind of uh, spans across uh, multiple kinds of projects and uh, some of the insights that I'm uh, presenting today are actually less than a week old. Uh, so it's, it's really, really like a year and now sort of a presentation. Uh, it's like a snapshot of everything that we're doing currently. And uh, it's very, very chaotic, but uh, hopefully it makes sense for a group of uh, chaos pilots like you guys. Uh, uh, so I think uh, what's uh, we, can, we kind of wanted to give a little bit of a background on our practice. Uh, we run a studio called The Bus Ride, uh, which is based in Bukkapo. It was has been for the longest time based in Bombay, uh, for the last uh, 12 years or so. And we recently, uh, two years ago, uh, we started off a studio in Goa called The Bus Ride Lab. Uh, this comes on the back of a little bit of uh, internal you know, understanding of what our practice was like uh, and what it still is actually in the in sort of a more mainstream design. Uh, practice sense. Uh, and also work kind of involves involve sort of, uh, creating kind of hospitality environments, uh, work environments, living environments from sort of a very small scale installation art sort of scale to you know currently working on building projects and towers stuff like that. So in, in many ways it's a very uh, standard design studio format. Uh, but what what had started happening uh, parallel to our mainstream of work, uh, which sort of uh, uh, some of you may have uh, either been here or visited some of the projects that we both on. Uh, so what had sort of started happening uh, quite often uh, was that we were also part of a couple of uh, smaller community based projects which is uh, something for the last 5-6 years we have been running something called the Bandra project which is a sort of a deep dive into what makes Bandra tick as a suburb. And this uh, it's a multi-headed multi-headed kind of inquiry. It's uh, at points being driven by students uh, and thesis projects. It's at points being driven by just interesting ideas that we had in the studio itself. And said, okay, let's see how we can uh, start a conservation program using food. So we set up this zero-profit restaurant called Gypsy Kitchen with a very close friend of mine, Gresham. So the idea is that we get housewives and house help uh, and old grannies, you know, essentially the best cooks. Uh, to kind of cook food in their homes, uh, we cater them to a table of 12 to 14 people. Uh, each person pays two and a half thousand rupees uh, per head for like a really elaborate sit down, 12 course, 13 course meal. And the money from that goes back to the home, uh, to the housewife. So essentially, trying to create a small micro economy around food. And uh, we found that those kind of projects actually resonate a lot, for, lot more than you know some of the more projects like top down signage projects, for example, or you know working with the BNC pedestrianization work, something like that. So uh, there was some sort of an inside building here under the surface of uh, the mainstream sort of, uh, commercial work that we were doing. And uh, where this brings us to uh, now is, you know, we were trying to actually, uh, you know, sort of make sense of all of this. And uh, we kind of felt that it's a good time to spin off another studio in Goa, which would actually be able to engage with these other projects uh, at a more meaningful level. So because uh, one of the things that I guess everyone thinks about or these are probably challenges that you guys are already facing right now with work is that there is a main stream of work that uh, or a main pipeline of work that you sort of enjoy and there's no problem in it but there's these sort of, sort of smaller eddy currents within that main flow that seem to be meaningful but they kind of get swept away by uh, you know the amount of time and bandwidth that the main sort of chunk requires to invest in. Um, we kind of decided to do something about it so we said let's spin up another studio that will incubate those any currents. Like you know, say, okay, how do we build a studio around the Gypsy Kitchen model? Or how do we build a studio around these couple of these community-based inquiries which are, you know, just resonating but we have no idea how to go about it. So I think the, the main thing, the sort of semi-brave thing we did, which we're still kind of hoping with, uh, is to cut off the pipeline of uh, some of those projects in a big way and sort of then migrate it to this other way of being. And uh, uh, What's, what's happened as a bit of a very recent insight is, you know, a lot of this has come up to, uh, you know, to create a working definition of time, right? Like, uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this because I think this is like a one of the central ideas and insights that we can base the rest of our practice on. Uh, typically, time is seen as a, you know, like a movement from the past to the future. Uh, with the present being this small dot on that line, right? So essentially a past exists behind you, future in front, and you're on the present moving 
along this uh, sort of line, which is uh, finally informed by Newtonian physics and uh, sort of a Western way of thinking about uh, science and time and measurement. And it's essentially seen as a progression from what existed to what will exist, and we are the we are the dot that's moving on that sort of line. Um, more sort of Eastern uh, mysticism and the Hindu sort of tradition. Uh, there's a much longer cycle which is associated with time, so think that's a kind of cyclical things that we do today. We will uh, see benefits of or the uh, uh, you know possible havoc tomorrow. Uh, so it's seen as cyclical. There's obviously a lot of symbology and metaphysics embedded in this, like the breadth of drama and all that. Essentially, at its notion, it can be diagrammed as a closed loop, and uh, that's another way of thinking of time. Um, but uh, the reality of things uh, is that uh, you know we're faced with uh, things that essentially create a lump in your throat uh, in different ways. I mean, so I'm sure like all of us have an itch that uh, you know that we're trying to scratch. Like it's one of those things which. Uh, so for me personally, I, when I see old buildings coming down, uh, primarily being replaced by things that are very very generic and faceless and completely insensitive in nature. Like this is something that really brings a lump to my throat. So I felt like uh, if one has to engage with these kind of projects uh, without being a preservationist, because I feel uh, that is equally emasculating, right? I mean, uh, the fact that you're in a world which everything has to be preserved, nothing new can be made, is also not a uh, fun vision for the future. And uh, neither is it progressive for uh, the cultural paradigm in which we sit, because in that case, Everyone would be preserving what exists in the past and we wouldn't be able to move forward. Neither is it uh, a sustainable way to say that we exist in a tabula rasa kind of situation where everything has to be raised and then new stuff can come up. Uh, there's also a lot of in-between nuances like adaptive reuse where you take the memory of an old structure or the old building and then sort of retrofit it aesthetically to kind of uh, service a new function. So all these processes exist on a vast spectrum. So yeah, essentially, if this is the scenario that one is given. There are all your palette of options visible right here on this image. Like you can either reconstruct, create a better, a more beautiful old bungalow, which could be then sold to some high net worth individual who wants to live in the heart of Bangalore. You could sort of construct a G plus seven story here, which forever destroys the village fabric uh, in this area. That the shadow of that building is going to fall on every single courtyard around. So the bottom masala industry shifts from Banda to Gorai. Uh, so these are the kind of uh, futures that are visible in one image, right? So depending on how you want to interpret this, uh, and it's really comes down to how we as people define our place in the movement of time. Like if we believe that time is linear, this is fine, right? This existed it had its time in the sun. Now what's going to come up? Has to respond to the uh, to respond to you know uh, a city that's heating up, a city that has. Okay, so food resources, it has to respond to all those things. Like you know, what you put up in its place will actually be more performative than what existed before. Uh, at the same time, there's a felt loss of beauty, of craft, of artisanal skill. So uh, all these things are things that come up to, if you define time as cyclical, uh, then you know one would have to do an adaptive reuse project where you say that I'm a part of a much larger cycle and what I do today will actually form a meaningful loop for someone 100 years down the uh, you know, down in my cycle. Um, so, this kind of, you know, uh, as you can probably sense, a lot of mindfuck in these uh, kind of questions because uh, it sort of, uh, you know, makes you question many things. Like, I mean, if you're sort of, uh, if you take a stance on this, then it defines your ethical model, you know, response to all these kind of uh, problems that will essentially come in the future. Uh, so, it's, uh, I feel it's very critical for all of us to kind of take away a notion of time for our own self, like where do we feel we exist in an ecosystem today, what can our contribution be, how powerful can it be, how limiting can it be. And if one is able to think about the grammar of that, uh, then I think many other smaller decisions actually are made much easier by uh, getting this sort of macro clarity on things, right? So, I'm speaking about this in a way that I can understand at all, but this is one week old, right? So, it's very clear with me. Uh, so, the most interesting definition of time uh, was actually narrated to me uh, 10 days ago uh, by this amazing individual called Professor Chaya from SEP. Right? So I'm not sure if people have actually interacted with him or have seen this really thin, small guy tugging his beard. Uh, I mean, he's an incredible character. And we had the pleasure of inviting him for one of our heritage labs to Goa uh, 10 days ago. And he kind of mentioned this thing in passing. And uh, it really got me thinking about uh, 
uh, how one could actually act this into a world view. Right, so he kind of mentioned this incident, I think, which most of us are sort of familiar with dimly in this Samudra Mantan, which is essentially the churning of the ocean of milk uh, with the inverted mountain, Andar, pulled by Jansuvas and Devas, right? And the Vasuki, which is the serpent around Shiva's name, was used to tie around the mountain in three worlds and then pull. Uh, and the, essentially the churning of the ocean then brought out many, many things, including Amra, including these, you know, wonderful gifts of the world that have sort of come out. So, I mean, obviously the first thing you do is diagram it, right? So, uh, so essentially that's uh, the ocean of milk, that's the Devas and Asuras, that's Vasuki, that's uh, Mount Nanda, which is a sort of inverted, uh, extremely uh, diamond kind of uh, mountain, it's like, you know, immovable. Uh, you have Shiva and Vishnu. So Shiva and Vishnu are significant here because uh, Vishnu uh, became Mohini, which is a seductress, and kind of uh, seduced uh, one of the Asuras who was running away with the uh, Amrit and managed to bring it back to the uh, Devas. And then obviously, there's a lot of like symbology like that. The guy was running away and managed to have one drop and he became immortal, but he was beheaded, so that became Rahu and Ketu. So there's a lot of other random like. Uh, spin-offs of this event uh, and then Shiva actually uh, was uh, approached by the gods because the gods were uh, strategically taking the tail end of the serpent the head end was given to the asuras so when they were pulling and churning the snake screwed out venom called halahala I think, and that's sort of taken into Shiva's throat but head without him getting poisoned so then uh, therefore the name deep cut uh, so and there's a lot of like really interesting symbology around this and uh, it sort of gets you thinking about what these things represent, right? So if you have to look at the same diagram, but look at it as uh, us and them. So depending on your self-image, you could be a deva or an asura. Uh, and it's for all, all of us to figure out who are we and therefore who are them, right? Like, so if you have a design studio, uh, uh, you are at one, one end of the spectrum, them could be government, uh, them could be clients, them could be uh, essentially anyone who you are in a tussle with, right? Uh, Vasuki becomes the notion of endless time. So that's the endless churning of the ocean in a much, much, much longer horizon than we are actually used to. So Vasuki becomes the thread. Uh, three coils are significant because it's the past, present, and future. Uh, that's actually why the snake grabs around Shiva's neck every time. Because that represents three coils of time. Uh, the mountain represents unbreakable will. Like it's a mountain that is never going to erode, never going to. Uh, it's your adamantine will, it's like the sort of will that you're born with and you will never compromise. And it's churning in an ocean of immense resilience, right? So essentially none of these are going to ever stop. This is never going to break and this is never going to stop it every day. And it's churning and the time is what is churning it uh, endlessly. And uh, there's geno uh, generosity by Shiva which is essentially represented by the idea of taking in venom but not letting it poison itself. Like he's holding the venom in his throat. So it's venom spewing from this whole churning which is happening uh, held in your throat without changing your own perception of what is going on in a system level. And the uh, seduction because at the end of the day designers are primarily this right? like pretty pictures, uh, future speculations. Uh, so essentially that's our uh, role in the ecosystem. Uh, as systems designers what happens is your role in the ecosystem is to uh, play the seductress uh, be the person with infinite generosity to swallow venom, make sure that none of the churning of the ocean is pushing out stuff that creates a sense of pessimism. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, life lessons to be drawn from a simple diagram, uh, which one can then abstract into practice. So this is what uh, got us thinking about what we should be as a uh, practice that starts engaging with time and how that can inform ethical decisions. Uh, right. um, what this really uh, hinges on is the, the grammar of collaboration. Right? If you're not collaborating with the people who are completely different from you, uh, like what happens is, uh, I mean, essentially the byproduct of that is intellectual masturbation. Like people get into a room, uh, it ends in obviously the election of Trump, it ends in uh, you know uh, Brexit. I mean, there's enough uh, examples of to show how incestuous groups who don't talk to each other, who don't, are not completely, uh, you know, collaborative in nature, actually create unethical, unsustainable uh, solutions. Uh, so we tend to surround ourselves with people who are very much like us. Uh, you know, for example, 
uh, any kind of uh, city building activity has to include the Shiv Sena, has to include the RSS, has to include all these. So essentially where you, where you draw the us and them pyramid, uh, the sort of uh, diagram has to be heavily informed by engaging with people who are very, very unlike you. So that's uh, the grammar of collaboration in its true sense, you know, where you are trying to collaborate with someone who you have nothing in common with. Um, infinite generosity, so like it's essentially uh, uh, the idea that we don't have, there's no short term answers. Like none of these issues that we face with today in terms of energy conservation, in terms of meaningful futures, none of them have short term answers and it's a, it's a question of how much generosity are you able to generate within your own practice or within your own being to be able to, you know, absorb anything that comes your way and sort of, uh, you know, uh, obviously. So any kind of tools, uh, people are into VR filmmaking, uh, like extremely selected right now, people are tool makers, artisanal barbers, I mean, whatever it is that is, you know, your tool of seduction, I think one of the things is to sort of hone it, hone it, hone it, and sort of keep on building on your tools so that the sort of power of seduction, the power of seduction, the power of all these things become extremely strong, and this is sort of a no brainer for design uh, or, you know, sort of people that engage in the creative arts because this is really what uh, we've been taught. Uh, also, the notion of time not being static, because uh, while we kind of assume that time moves, uh, it's normally assumed that time is moving as a sort of a dot, the present is a dot moving on a straight line from the past to the future, or it's a dot moving on the cycle. Uh, the, the notion of the churn is very interesting for me personally. I feel like if time is churning, like it's, it's sort of pulling into the future, pulling into the past, pulling into the future, pulling into the past, yeah, it's a very different dynamic from this present movement along a curve, uh, a curve which uh, to my mind the churn is really symbolic of the kind of culture and the kind of paradigm we have today, right? Uh, I'm sure we face it uh, in a very, very intangible but very, very perceived way, like a sort of constant churning of time, where we import it in many ways at the same time, but uh, I think it's important for us to internalize the nature of the churning, like saying that this is the way it is, this is reality. And now how does one move? and engage with this to sort of pull out uh, you know, gems. Uh, again, the idea of imposing unbreakable will on infinite residents, right? So, uh, we assume that uh, these large edifices don't change. So, it's actually pointless to start engaging in uh, changing the mountain or changing the ocean. Like, the point is to actually be in this time, right? So, sort of understand that this is a long process. This has always happened in the past and it will always happen in the future. And what is our role in it is to kind of churn better, right? So, um, again, uh, the experience of engaging with both the head and the tail of time. So, I feel this has been a big learning for us uh, internally because we started off being a studio which was very passionate about heritage conservation. Right? So, that's our, uh, that building coming down, that's Xavier Villa which is right outside our old studio. And uh, it's uh, one of those things that uh, was a bit of a cathartic moment for us as well, saying that you know, we're a design studio, we exist in this beautiful village, but this thing can come down right outside our door and you know, we don't know who's brought it down, we don't know who sold it to whom. Uh, we are just going to be faced with the spectrum of what comes up next. So there is a sense of uh, helplessness as well, um, which also then starts you thinking about if you were if you were given this project, what would you have done, right? Like, I mean, say what what would your response be? And the sad part is our response would probably have been something very similar to what has actually come up. So then it throws everything up into uh, question, right? Like you are build, build, building within the city's bylaws, you are building. Uh, structure that the city demands, you have to put for parking, you have to create uh, your dwelling and residence for so many people. This is their aspiration being in Bangalore, they want to live in a place with a pitch roof, so you're going to put that pitch roof on a three story building. So these are all logical decisions which then physically sculpt the building that comes up there. So, in that, so I mean, what I feel is uh, the heritage uh, conversation only, which is existing only with the tail of the snake, it, it, it reads myopia. Like we are not able to look along the length of the snake to see the head. So if you are existing in the future's uh, domain uh, as well, along with uh, you know the other side, which can only come through collaborations, uh, you are able to see both sides of the snake, you are able to see the length of the churn, and then you are able to actually create meaning for the present through engaging with both sides of uh, the conversation. So that's what we really started our inquiry into speculative sections, saying that you know, uh, while we are passionate about heritage conservation, I don't feel a meaningful direction is going to come from only studying the past. Right? It's, it's going to come from where is culture headed? Like what is the future of jobs? What is the future of skill? What is the future of craft? You know, like, uh, uh, 
uh, like, I mean, most of us carry laptop bags right now, right? It's essentially someone somewhere sat and designed a bag for middle management, and all of us are using it today, right? So uh, it's really sad that we are living in this kind of paradigm where you know we are super supremely talented people and we have so many influences, but our accessories, our clothes, our dwellings speak nothing of that uh, richness of lived experience. Right? So. Uh, again, long horizons, endless iterations. So, uh, a lot of patients, you have this endless notion of time, so obviously, you know, instant gratification is not going to happen, so I think something we should probably, you know, kick out of our toolkit right in the beginning. I think Mans is talking a little bit about uh, framing issues as wicked problems, so that's like, you know, a really new framing, like that these are problems without solutions. So forget about the solutionary aspect of problem, solution, problem, solution, that's a very uh, limited way of thinking. These are iterations along a much, much longer path. So your only job is to iterate, is to create one step in that positive direction. It's the sort of bacon race, right? At the end of your lived experience, you pass on the bacon and hope that the guy's going to run the next. Uh, uh, and uh, and yeah, so essentially, if you imagine that time is constantly churning, then what your experience of reality is always a negotiation. It's always going to be the best of the past, the best of the future, the best of the past, best of the future. And you're constantly trying to, you know, create meaning out of that journey. So yeah, so that's the sort of framing of all our uh, confusions. Uh, what I thought is like we can sort of take you through a little bit of a roller coaster right through some of what uh, the studio is doing right now. Uh, again, whenever you guys view this stuff, make sure that you're viewing it with a sense that it's a work in progress. There's no definite answers here. These are just us trying to make sense of the world. Like, you know, uh, I mean, if in cooking terms, like this is the chewing of the food. It's not really the end dish. Uh, so we started something called the Bombay Boomtown project. This was around six years ago. Like we started, uh, you know, pulling out uh, data from old Maharashtra gazettes. So the only record of uh, Bombay as a city uh, that exists uh, in a 200 year data set is through the Maharashtra gazettes. I think around eight to ten years ago being digitized. So this is a, it's a beautiful resource. It's like uh, it's a very strange view of what existed in the last 200 years. So it's like looking at someone's laundry lists or grocery lists and trying to piece together like a view of culture. Right? So it's a really like strange nuts and bolts kind of a thing. But what we started doing was that we said let's take all these data points that we're getting from this data and research and try to plot them onto a 200 year graph to just see what's going on. Right? So it started like that. Uh, this is the graph of the number of mills in the city. Um, what I do is maybe after this I can post a link to, this, to these graphs on the uh, community page so it gets where I want to post it. But, um, I mean, essentially, this this is World War One, uh, right? So, sorry, World War Two. Uh, World War Two hits the nationwide uh, demand for uh, cotton and textile moves to Manchester in the UK because uh, Indian cotton couldn't reach uh, the markets, and then you see the slump that starts in uh, textile. Right? So, essentially, you can. So, these are world events uh, that are plotted along a timeline of the number of mills in the city and over a period of 100 years. Right? So, uh, this is one sort of set of data. Uh, this is the number of theatres in Bombay. So from the uh, from the first time we kind of see this uh, big jump up, and we kind of at the uh, this is the number of trains per day. So that's the first train which left from uh, Victoria Terminus to Thane in 1852. And then uh, you see this big spike. These big jumps are actually when they introduced nine car uh, uh, nine car trolleys and twelve car trolleys. So that actually. The same thing started getting more augmented in terms of capacity, so you see big spikes in the graph there. Uh, this is the capacity of suburban areas, obviously goes off the charts after a point, but uh, this is population, population goes off the charts only in 1940. It's impossible to make a chart for 1.8 for all the people right now, so it's like, <laughs> uh, but essentially you see, uh, you know, trends in uh, this sort of data. Uh, that's the Hindi film production, uh, so it's a, uh, now, uh, this seems like a really stupid exercise uh, to begin with, uh, but what was really, really interesting for us is when you start uh, interrelating the graphs. You put one graph over the next and you start seeing stories emerging. So, you look at the decline of the mills and the subsequent rise of theatre. This point in the middle is actually when Marathi theatre was born in Bombay. Right? This is out of work mill workers agitating against the management. So, this is the Dasha Saman strike. 
uh, you have the crash of the mill lands in Bombay and the subsequent rise of the theatre which happens uh, around the other and uh, this area we are sitting right now, right? So these are all confiscated properties. So anyway, so, uh, so one starts to see city events uh, and meaningful sort of possibilities in this data. Um, that's actually really interesting because uh, this is a graph which is number of people per household and the population. So in most cases, in most linear cities, you would have a parallel graph. Like as the population is growing, the number of people per household is sort of also growing uh, accordingly. But you see this massive fall in the 19, uh, 1970s. This is uh, Dharavi. So essentially what happened was number of people in the city is growing off the charts, but they fall off the census because there's no census data from Dharavi. So Asia's largest slum exists at a place where this massive drop happens in the census data. So uh, one, once you start seeing uh, on a much, much longer timeline, uh, what is kind of really interesting is that the notion of time changes a lot. Like the notion of time from being a linear point A to point B to the cyclic and other thing, you start looking at time as a waveform. Right? Time is full of fluctuations. Time is actually a graph of ebbs and flows. And uh, it brings you uh, back to the churning metaphor where uh, this notion of time being a constant churn is kind of represented as uh, data points in a city that we all live and inhabit. So uh, I feel like projects like this are able to actually uh, allow a worldview uh, to be validated uh, through data. Right? Um, now what does this mean for us as design practitioners? Because it's one thing to end it here and say, wow, oh, amazing, how many or whatever has always been a way. So, uh, towards meaningful city futures, this allows us to now say uh, hypothesize trends. So, that's 1800 to 2010. Uh, let's see what the world looks like, say, 15 years down the line, right? So, essentially, these are uh, this is the one religion time share kiosk. So, essentially, this is uh, backed up by uh, you know the shrinking of parishes in churches, the shrinkage of uh, you know uh, mosque growing populations. So essentially what you have is an LED kiosk which is programmed, a bit like how Blue Frog is programmed. Uh, so you have in the morning you have your RT, which is a digital RT. Uh, post that you have a, it's on you know, Friday evenings, it becomes a mosque. Uh, you have the Azan from the really high definition speakers. Uh, and essentially what you can do is use your uh, cube to become different religious uh, monuments at different times. And people can put in you know, uh, requisitions to have your own religious event. Um, this is the wave energy harvesting Petra Ports. The idea that you know, Bombay, uh, India has one of the longest coastlines in the world with a tidal variation of over 5 meters. So it's begging for tidal harvesting, uh, tidal energy harvesting. And you can actually create uh, you know, hydraulic Petra Ports which have spinnerets on the side which create capacitance in the middle. And sort of uh, from the center it can be sort of pumped back into the city as a system of clean energy source. So that's then it's called a marine drive in 2025. Uh, this is an idea for a group of gorilla solar artists called the tree surgeons. So these guys actually figure out the carcasses of old trees in the city, uh, which is the best relationship that we have with them right now. And uh, they kind of graft solar panels onto them. So you use the existing phyllotaxy to create a solar installation, which then powers up small communities around the, uh, the base of the tree. Um, gorilla ad boards, so ads like Hariputta are then sort of replaced by uh, vertical gardens which one can navigate. Uh, so. And that's the Haji Ali Skuba pilgrimage. Uh, so this is after the coastal road comes up, massive flooding, uh, you know, tidal levels in Bombay, the seas are shallowing out, so essentially you can only visit the Haji Ali through scuba diving now. Uh, you can sort of take a nice boat there in the middle, dive down and sort of do a scuba pilgrimage. And that's uh, Malabar Hills, so that's Antila. Uh, and then harvesting their uh, sunlight through this uh, LED balloon actually. So it sort of uh, channels natural light into the rooms. So, yeah. um, so one of the things was, uh, I mean while these speculations were happening, uh, they were mostly uh, you know, in a more playful sort of zone. They don't really kind of, uh, you know, directly. They're not topical. They're not topical enough to actually generate conversation on things that are actually happening. So a while ago, um, we were, you know, 
uh, given this gift of a, I think what, 3,600 crore statue that's uh, supposed to come up uh, India, sort of, you know, outside Bombay. And uh, we start thinking about, you know, it's an amazing thing, right? Like, I mean, to build a statue is a very human act. Like, we've been doing this for centuries and eons. Like, it's a very, very human act to build a statue, so that's fine. But the amount of allocation of funds towards something that is uh, inherently ornamental and a symbol of uh, deep politics, right? So that's really uh, what the statue is going to be, the legacy is going to leave behind, uh, or things like that. So, how can one use the monumentality of a statue to actually uh, perform better for the city, right? So, and statues are normally kind of associated with. Uh, Statues are sort of associated with, uh, you know, the toppling of regimes in many ways. Uh, so you have uh, U.S. occupation of Iraq. Um, so one of the things that we started working with was what would a statue be like if it was performing? Like the statue was there as a symbol of huge amount of investment into uh, the public domain, like with a massive upgrade in civic infrastructure. Right? So I think we quickly flip through this. So this is uh, some of the five scenarios that we kind of generated, saying that this is the uh, scenario that the statue should respond to if it was a sensible statue. Uh, so India produces the number, uh, it's the fifth largest e-waste producer in the world. Right, so 2 million tons in 2016. And so we said like what are the statue was the uh, e-waste uh, recycling uh, statue, right? So I mean, we've used Gandhi because it's like putting, you know, like a block. I mean, Gandhi is now outside for it takes, it's become like, I mean, he's on the currency, it, it generates no shock or uh, is beyond subjectivity basically. Gandhi has actually put that all in. So like uh, there's Gandhi and this Chalka and the point is that he's sort of this huge uh, urban mind with uh, sort of uh, like a lot of modern metals that we need for our new phones for things that they don't exist in nature anymore. They have to be mined from old electronics. Right? So there's a massive infrastructure of uh, urban mining below the statue and then obviously the gold that's rescued from PCBs finds its way as a public donation onto the statue. Um, India is obviously also involved in uh, one of the most ambitious uh, clean energy renewal program. So one of the things was to kind of uh, look at a massive energy harvesting installation with a uh, huge turbine in the Lungi area which kind of generates you know, massive amounts of wind. Parallel uh, energy installations at the bottom. So it's uh, kind of harvesting any kind of energy flows that are happening around the coastal city and then uh, slowly upgrades the uh, um, drinking water, huge problem, proposed to be a massive problem by 2015. Uh, so obviously a desalination statue makes a lot of sense uh, for, for a coastal city. Uh, desalination plants are powering almost 40% of uh, coastal city uh, you know, supply like in Israel, uh, in the UAE, and huge uh, plants and centers set up that way. Uh, recycling lands, obviously this is the Gandhi Memorial Affordable Housing Scheme. Uh, a green, nice green sculpture and within that you have right of the apartments. Um, and then uh, obviously the narrative of ecological value as uh, so ecological value is actually right now in our current paradigm looked at as a hurdle for development, right? It's like why do we need all these trees over here? They can be somewhere else. So I mean so the statue could actually respond to that in the sense that it's a large uh, aquatic nature park with a sort of a regenerative coral reef scaffolding at the base of the statue because that's going to happen anyway so we might as well put a nice scaffolding to what I have mean, property over there. So, uh, so there's, uh, I mean obviously these are like, uh, and there's just five so we thought like we could just at least do 50. So we got like, you know, push on this one. This is the, and we got a lot of critique on this thing, why only Gandhi, so also male, you know, like uh, <laughs> with the, uh, you know, women representation, so we can have, this is Shahi Bhagat Singh, uh, offshore grain silo, sovereign in seed bank. So this sort of statue powers the seed banking needs of Maharashtra in 2025. That's your uh, Kasturba Gandhi Memorial Server and City Data Center. Right? <laughs> so this is essentially when the BMC uh, has been outsourced to AI. Uh, so essentially our large server act is running the city. Uh, less corrupt, more efficient, uh, better use of public resource in every single way. Uh, this is actually something we're going to start now is to kind of do a department by department analysis of the BNC and see where all we can source out into AI. Uh, something should be right. 
and uh, so this the idea was that we get these competing algorithms which are in a competitive network to service the city's needs. Uh, we get the algorithms to play Batman uh, to kind of figure out who's superior depending on what they win. So the city gets to watch these hyper fast frequency Batman matches as part of their skyline. Kasturva <coughs> Gandhi watches it from there. And obviously the VR operator has public transport stack. This is a pixel art movement. Uh, so essentially when all these trains are docked in with this augmented public transport stack, you can have VR operators smiles at us once every <laughs> evening. And uh, it's coming at a good time because there's a huge talk about privatizing BST, right? Uh, yeah. uh, other retarded things. So, I mean the point is to kind of, uh, you know, uh, anyway, create topical and provocations around these kind of scenarios and Approach them in a slightly more playful way, like without getting depressed about it. So I think Alice is like, I mean, you are going to have some fun with it. So that's one uh, inquiry into the sort of deep history and future of Bombay. So that was the idea of sort of look at a 200 data set, study the city as waveforms, see where it's moving in the future, and try to propose provocations or interesting scenarios using tools of speculative design uh, or move any angle into uh, <laughs> Um, so anyway, so uh, this is another, another really, really interesting way to uh, engage with futures. Meghna uh, Jara, who's part of an interesting course that, we, uh, that I teach at NID called uh, Around Futures. Um, so this is something we did which started it off for us. Like, this is a collaborative project with a few studios in the UK. Um, and uh, there's some amazing people as part of this lab, uh, people part of uh, Studio PSK. There were some really, really incredible people that come up to India for this. And uh, we had a really, really amazing exchange because they had identified a few practices from India and a few practices from the UK to kind of put together in a room and come up with uh, interesting scenarios for the world building in a very non-movie way. It was a more real way, you know, so what we actually do. Um, so uh, it introduced uh, our studio to a whole bunch of new techniques, which is uh, writing hypothetical newspapers. It's a very, very powerful tool. Like you kind of curate and write a newspaper from the future. It forces you to think of the future in a very different way. It forces you to think of, uh, say, if you're writing a comedy column in a 2035 newspaper, like what's funny then, right? Like, like are people laughing because the first human that's married a robot? Are they laughing because you know uh, gender has collapsed and no one knows uh, how to frame matrimonials anymore? You know, so what are people actually finding funny in 2035? Or what are your matrimonial columns like? What is the politics of that year? What are the sports in that year? It allows you to actually look at culture in a very, very nuanced, very fine grained kind of a way, which is really not what uh, we are presented as uh, future speculations coming from the West. Right? Like we are giving this view of everything being shiny, glossy, Shanghai, Bangkok, whatever, and put into this sort of a glossy, untextured, uh, impersonal narrative. Uh, which is really how Hitler communicated his views to uh, Germans, right? Like it's a very imperialist, fascist, top-down way of looking at futures. And futures don't exist that way. Like today we have rivalist cars in Palo Alto, but we also have a centuries-old farming tradition in uh, just outside Maharashtra. So the future is always a spectrum. It's never going to be a single defined point. The future is for each one of us to figure out what it is that we want to do in the future. It's not about you know some techno-deterministic Elon Musk kind of character telling us that this is how people are going to live. So that's part of the spectrum, it's never the whole picture. Um, the newspaper actually allows you to engage with in that way. So, you know, for example, your 3D printer installed at all Starbucks outlets worldwide. Right? So, so there's some very mundane things which are like, you know, fine, but uh, India's first youth-led don't touch unless ask campaign. Uh, so because people are living in such closed confines that now they have don't touch unless ask campaigns, saying that, you know, please don't touch me in a public space. There's a collapse of antibiotics. Uh, data is now a cultural commodity. So, uh, what, this, what the newspaper headline exercise also allows us to think about is uh, communicating a larger issue in a very short way. Like, we don't write a white paper about it, you kind of uh, just put it out as a sensational headline that allows you to kind of make sense of your own process in a very different way. So, anyway, this is like quite elaborate this exercise. Uh, we actually, as a group, uh, came down to uh, sort of three different large inquiries and uh, they were kind of you know filtered as per you know the most whimsical to the most implementable and we kind of then put that on a timeline so the, the most random ones were put outside this 100 years plus and the more believable ones which were like you know near to say minus 20 years and the middle ones were 50 years so 
Uh, so I just take 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 you through a little bit of this. Maybe uh, this kind of interesting. Uh, one was this uh, provocation around data cities. So saying that we as a population are generating so much data on a daily basis that we will essentially now start need to living with uh, we need to start living with servers, right? So we don't need to construct our buildings using brick and mortar. We have to start conducting uh, or constructing them using semiconducting materials, where our architecture of cities itself becomes a vessel for data. Right, so uh, now what does data do is it generates a lot of heat because processing it generates heat. So our cities need cooling. Uh, so therefore cities of the future will actually be in the Arctic for ice cap, uh, you know, surrounded by our own data. Especially for us it's not that important, but if you're a stock trading company uh, which is generating very extremely high frequency algorithms which require to compete at very, very fast speeds, uh, cooling becomes a huge uh, problem for data cities. So, if you start looking at the city built on data, it allows you to start thinking about cities in a very different way. Right? Uh, this is cities after antibiotics. So around 2040 is roughly when broad spectrum antibiotics are uh, started to collapse for all of us. So there's a possible future where you could die of a small cut. Right? Because broad, broad spectrum antibiotics, because of low level doping along the whole food chain. Uh, a lot of the, they still don't work. I mean, there's super bugs right now outside the domain of broad spectrum antibiotics. So, one is to think that, okay, we're going to find a cure where humans are sorted, that's fine. So this sort of future explores the fact that there is no cure and how do you start thriving and living in a place like that. So it forms a design language where any sharp edges are actually banned by the government. Because uh, you could potentially die of them, right? So everything becomes organic, everything becomes bloody, everything kind of becomes... Uh, or uh, marijuana will be the cure in the true sense. So this is a distant hundred year future. Uh, and it's sort of populated by many smaller futures which we find interesting to explore. The one I personally worked on was uh, Chernobyl becomes a habitable city again because uh, for me this was very close to India. I felt like uh, the fact that Chernobyl exists as a place. Uh, so for you, for you guys not familiar with Chernobyl, is the place where one of the massive nuclear fallouts happened. Uh, there was a reactor that melted down, pretty much uh, cleared out the whole city. Uh, but what's happened interestingly, if you study it in further detail, is that Chernobyl is now a wildlife haven. As soon as humans existed, uh, so in many ways the best thing that happened to Chernobyl was that nuclear accident, right? Because uh, if you don't consider humans, right? uh, so and what happens is uh, mutations actually are not as bad as we think. They die out in two generations because the first thing that mutations did is your reproductive system, like they don't allow you to reproduce. It's a failsafe from nature. So except for some things like albinism, like there are some sparrows which are albino populations living in Chernobyl even now, uh, which is fine. White sparrows. <laughs> uh, but like uh, bear populations have multiplied by eight times, wolf populations have you know multiplied. So uh, nature's come back in a big way. So what our provocation was that India is a land of mini Chernobyl. Like Bombay is a mini Chernobyl right now. It's a mini disaster area we travel. So how does one thrive in that sort of situation? And how do you actually again not slip your risk? I keep coming back to the slipping your risk metaphor, but uh, I think optimism is one of the most uh, important building blocks of any kind of speculative fiction. Right? Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that. So what we started doing was to create artifacts from this future. Right? So like if you have to start living in Chernobyl, and uh, what would be an interesting artifact that you could bring back into the present, which then talks about that future perspective. Right? Um, so anyway, I'll speak to some of the other stuff. This is Los Angeles after the crash, capsule transit networks, no sharp edges, everything kind of thing. Uh, so what we started thinking about is what if there was this hypothetical guy who's shifting from a utopian situation right now. So he's an Italian guy. He's like you know, part of this really beautiful village in 2016, but that village is completely you know overrun by polluting firms, do that so. And he's moving to Chernobyl because now Chernobyl is the the place to be. Uh, it's a sort of neglected old uh, nuclear silo which is now being sort of converted into. So it, it's called a shared model planning application. So this is like actually a planning application that this Italian guy submitted to the planning authorities, and it's been rejected by them. Uh, so we submitted, we, made, we created the whole planning application form with the rejection uh, letter, with his passports, with the rejection stamp, and it's a very random project. But that is, so I mean, just give you a sense of the content because uh, a lot of the detail is actually in the nuances. Like we need to go through all these things to actually figure out what is being spoken about because at its at its first level vision, it's a file on a table. Right? So, describe what provisions have been made to repel ambient radiation. So, this guy is actually supposed to write about the kind of measures that he's taken in his architecture, 
to actually uh, you know counteract ambient radiation levels. So it allows you to think about uh, how would people live in a radiated society. Right? Uh, so anyway, so it goes on with a bunch of provocations around that. We make the detection stand. That's the uh, that's his floor plan of the house that he's building. And this floor plan was also rejected because it's a dog kennel that's right next to the wolf population because somehow the dog is going to bark all night and disturb your neighbors. So please move the kennel from there somewhere. So you know, you kind of try to live through this whole thing, uh, put yourself in that situation, start telling stories around, and then sort of start designing features for That's his passport. So obviously, you're saying that it's going to be a genetic based passport. Uh, that's his ATCG sequences. That's all the countries that he's been to. Uh, as you know, that's very highly promiscuous travel happening in the future. Uh, that's a bank statement. So these are all the places, all the servers in which his money is uh, worldwide. And his uh, biggest uh, thing is actually on a satellite because uh, the satellite servers are now outside Earth uh, legislation. So people are parking their black money uh, on satellite kind of banks. So there's SH HSBC City, which is a hypothetical bank that's you know now ruling the world. So there's all that. And this is a planning for Shermont Town. So this is a publicity brochure that he's been given by the Shermont Township, saying that you know these are the things. This is a gold block. This club is great. Uh, these are some of the island homes, museum and visitor center. Um, yeah, so that's, okay. um, so that's how it started. Uh, guys, tell me if it's getting boring. I can actually switch to the Q&A right way. No, you just have to be a little louder. Though. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, for tomorrow's news, uh, what we started doing was uh, so this is actually interesting because uh, once uh, you start getting a uh, addicted to these tools, you can start figuring out how you can actually you know share these processes and learn more, learn a lot more. So uh, post this lab, uh, I actually started uh, going back to campus when I need to uh, start teaching future fiction and uh, you know speculative design as a process, and um, it obviously heavily references a lot of what. Uh, Mansi presented earlier, like Dan and Dabi, uh, these kind of, you know, very, very uh, cool. And all of, what's really exciting about this, I feel this is a process for our time. Like, I feel it's not like we're sitting on something which was spoken about in the 60s and we're, you know, forced to live with right now. Like, I feel like this is really of our time. Things that are written for us, it's things that are making sense to us right now. It kind of very, very nicely reflects this churn. So, for me, I feel like, uh, you know, being involved in a student and a campus kind of situation is really enriching as well. So we started building the old city as a place to uh, start our first, uh, the first course actually happened here. And uh, that group came up with a newspaper called Pole Pole. So this is the poles in Ahmedabad are actually the, the term for the old settlements. So they did this uh, hypothetical newspaper saying that Ahmedabad takes Uttarayan to the next level. So essentially people are flying drones for Uttarayan. And there are drone wars and there's all that kind of stuff going on in the world of the old city. Uh, smart goals and smart doors. So uh, the idea of these uh, newspapers is to actually do a very quick ideation and uh, circulate to people. So I think that's the main thing is that you want to get this word out as much as possible because the reactions to these things are really what are the learnings for the course. Like you want to see how people react to these things on a day-to-day -day basis. Like you know, what's an Uttarayan drone going to, uh, what's a drone Uttarayan going to look like? What are the tickets you sell? What is the branding for that event? How do you actually do a prototype? So these are all the fun things that one can actually start engaging in. Uh, so anyway, there's tourism projects, there's survival of flying species in a holographic world project. So there's all these sort of mini ideas which are put out in the newspaper. Uh, for me, this is one of the most interesting ones that came out of this. Uh, this is actually based on a provocation that I was uh, kind of trying to develop together with this student, Harsha. Uh, so we had this idea that there's an earthquake and the whole of the old city is actually collapsed, but in a semi-intact form. Right, so it's not uh, smashed, because they're all timber homes, they're very resilient, they kind of move with the... And so part of that could actually be have... So it's essentially converting an entire old city into a kit of parts. Right? Now how does one reassemble those kits to become a uh, performative for, uh, uh, for, for a current use? So he came up with this really interesting idea of having a steel scaffolding and you reconstruct the old city in a vertical format. So, and then uh, the idea was to kind of then study uh, you know, quality of space, how do you create quarters above homes, stuff like that. So the same uh, formats on the old city were then kind of reworked from uh, sort of steel scaffolding structure. Uh, so to start the course off, I mean, what we normally do is 
send in news articles from the future. Uh, so this, I mean, one thing we realize about Ahmedabad is that Gujaratis are the most ideal residents of Mars. Right? Because if you look at uh, the Mars One uh, recruiting guidelines, they need uh, primarily vegetarian because uh, meat is very tough, very resource intensive to grow on Mars. We need, uh, they have some idea from Bombay candy making stores. So all these ideas are Martian menu. <laughs> Full pop head plus for <laughs> so, uh, so essentially, we have uh, you know these kind of provocations around uh, like being an Ahmedabadi resident is actually a great advantage certainly in the future because you can live in very close spaces. Uh, it's very important. Uh, you have uh, strong affinity to vegetarian food. Uh, you can survive extremes of temperature because Ahmedabad is one of the largest diameter ranges of temperature. So, mass requires that. Uh, so it's amazing, right? So a lot of the so we have Mars on poles, essentially we are an old city form built on Mars uh, reassembly. Uh, textile mills again, this is sort of next up path for textiles. So I just kind of get pharma companies uh, invest in medicinal textiles. So how does Endobadi uh, cotton and Endobadi spinning actually form part of a uh, rehabilitated process using medicinal uh, garments and stuff like that. So, uh, so while these are you know, tiny news articles, I mean, for us, they represent mini projects. You know, these are things that want to prototype very quickly and sort of see if there are takers, you know, it's just a matter of putting it out there as much as possible so that uh, then there's a sort of interconnected web that starts building. There could be someone somewhere who sees some residence and there's a project created. We may, we may or may not be involved in that project, but the idea is to actually start putting this output out as much as possible. Uh, so one of the students actually did a very interesting project. He uh, he said like uh, his main thing was communal harmony. He's like, how do I create communal harmony using food? Right, so interesting enough, he was doing a lot of what Bombay Candy does now. Like kind of uh, look at uh, India as a uh, palette without considering cultural nuances, without considering uh, boundaries of uh, you know, religion. Uh, any kind of limiting boundaries are dissolved. And you consider a much larger exploration around food. So, like for example, what's a biryani made like by a Jain priest, or what's a you know? So, I mean, one can frame this problem in many interesting ways. And he took his tab it was called Dumaan so you kind of designed the whole back way to do And this is actually uh, some pages for, so for the next course. What we said is we take one step up from the newspaper, let's go zine. So we can explore color and slightly better production process. <laughs> so that's your. Uh, uh, immortality server, so essentially the idea is that uh, all your data lives on after you, you can still wish your children from the grave uh, happy birthday, you can do all of that. Uh, but it requires you to invest in this server now which constantly learns your habits and procedures. So you don't die when you, you, don't, you don't die on social media, you kind of have a life after. Uh, Justin Trudeau, world president. So this is, uh, uh, he's actually elected world president once he matures and uh, <laughs> really wise guy and uh, the world says that we don't need our individual leaders anymore because the problems we're facing, terrorism, uh, global capital, these are not problems that individual prime ministers can even start thinking about. Like we need to start thinking about planetary system. So Justin Trudeau is then the world president, he's kind of governing uh, all of that. Visa arrival in 84 countries has <laughs> world policy. Uh, this is a bioengineered milk, it's an ad within the zine. So, Essentially, uh, this is after bovine flu, uh, massive epidemic of, of bovine flu, and uh, we as a race decided that we need to synthetically engineer it. It's not worth the pain anymore. So, this is spot the difference. If you can spot the difference, you can wrap up QR code, it takes you to the other And that's actually something that uh, one of the most interesting outputs of this project for me personally was uh, so this Megna and uh, Sal sort of fed around jobs. Like, what are jobs in the future going to be like? Like, say, if you're in a power grid company. Say you work in the BST in Bombay. What is your job in the future going to look like? So in 15 years' time, what can you expect to be the city's power uh, requirements? I mean, you actually need to have a collaborative project going on with the DJ who understands how to sense the room and how to send electricity to places where it's required. But you don't have a constant allocation of electricity, but you have a city that's a uh, very responsive map of the city. And then it's almost like a musician, you're, allo you're allocating power to those places where it needs at that point. So we have a program DJ who comes in and plays with the city's electricity supply in a much more responsive way than the way the electricity system is distributed to us today. So there are, once you map out these adjacencies between what's going on in music, what's going on in the electricity department, 
what's going on in AI, what's going on in food, what's going on in culture, one can actually make interesting cross connections. Right? So for us for the longest time, we've been doing this for the last three years, but there's been no place to actually have an output. I mean, you know, what do you do with this information? Uh, so we recently uh, started finding multiple outputs. So instead of doing one thing, we said let's see how we can actually look at uh, beautiful problems. Right? So, uh, Again, taking you back into time, I think this presentation will be a bit chaotic because you constantly refer the past and the future all the time. But uh, so this is Chan Bauri, which is this, uh, I mean, all of you may know it from Dark Knight. Uh, this is the step well from which Christian Bale kind of climbs out. So it's a beautiful, beautiful structure. And at its heart, if one is able to define uh, these age-old step wells as problem-solution uh, definitions, right? So there's a response to aridity and response to the desert climate of Rajasthan uh, in this beautiful structure, uh, which is actually, uh, I mean, breathtakingly beautiful. So uh, as water fills up from the underground aquifers, levels keep rising, the community can access it at multiple levels. It's always uh, at least 8 to 10 degrees cooler at the base from the surface. It's uh, primarily designed, funded, and built by women. So it's a very interesting uh, political act of building step wells. Uh, there's always a temple or some kind of religious significance in the middle to sanctify the water. So the temple, religion is used as a vessel or a tool to be able to keep the water clean. Right? Uh, surface water is actually undrinkable water in most of these arid countries. Right? Which is why this whole riverfront development in uh, Ahmedabad is such a travesty because we're losing that much water on a daily basis to evaporation. When this is a much better way of holding water which is actually drinkable. So essentially what the city has done is prioritize aesthetics over functionality. It's squeezed the river into a concrete well, which has created a pond on both sides. Like, I think if you put a coconut in that river, it doesn't move. Like, there's no flow, it just stays there. Okay. You can come back after a weekend, the coconut is right there. So it's very strange. But this is the sort of a beautiful expression of a problem solved, right? It's a problem of identity, drought, uh, cultural response, bringing women together and the time in the afternoon when it's very hot but they have the time like in the morning they have chores in the evening they have chores so this is obviously a culture's response to this beautiful problem um, and you see this everywhere I mean you see this uh, beautiful response to problem solving at multiple places in the past as Rani Kibar so we started doing a study of 50 uh, beautiful problems in the past and correspondingly started thinking about 50 beautiful problems of the future Right, so what are our problems of the future going to be like? Right, so we have essentially a problem of clean energy. But look at our response today. This is the Tesla Giga Factory in Nevada. Right? I mean, there's no worse ex there's no worse expression of a problem solved than this. A high barbed wire fence on all sides. Uh, it's a pretty much run by automatons. Like there's no uh, not too many humans running these Giga factories. Uh, massive land use without any kind of uh, giving back to culture, without creating any kind of sense of community around it. So, I mean, to my mind, this is the worst response that we as a human species could have for the problem of collecting solar energy, right? And at the same time in the desert, you have Burning Man, uh, which uh, responds to similar problems through art and design. Uh, this is how celebratory a solar panel can actually be, right? So, uh, without creating big fences, without creating the sense of uh, or random stand of with people, you can actually create a celebration around a solar, a solar factory and solar park which makes it a lot more inclusive, you have place making benefits, you have economic benefits. I think this is a matter of reframing how we look at the past and the future and sort of take clues from the celebration of the past and apply them to the problems of the future and so try to create bridges between these processes. There's something actually involved very important place strangely, it's called the Order of the Dark Temple. So this is set up by this crazy uh, professor from Serbia called Garden. Uh, he's actually a completely crazy guy. Like he set up one of Europe's biggest festivals called the Exit Festival. And through the festival, people there, it's a 100 day dance festival. So they're dancing one part of the year. So uh, through the festival, they, halfway through the festival, they realized that so many young people, conversations started happening, they decided to overthrow the government. So they stormed the government uh, and sort of, uh, you know, take over. They have the rest of the festival in the uh, in, I think the Prime Minister residence. It's some bizarre story. So he's the curator of that festival. And he's now a professor at the University in Novosad. So he's actually uh, teaching uh, digital privacy. And uh, we've done this a uh, lot of work with him along the steps. So now we've set up this code of the Dark Temple, which essentially 
sounds a bit like a modern Freemason kind of solution. But it's <laughs> <laughs> and it's set in Endo also. Essentially, you have this uh, dark mandir, and you have a this, this is a way of avoiding uh, Wi-Fi signals and it's avoiding sort of uh, connectivity. So it's the right to disconnect. Right? That's your uh, the dark temple stands for the right to disconnect. This can be surgically implanted inside pigeons. It can be so anything can be made into a dark temple by using a Faraday cage, or you could actually have many technological. Like you put your phone in a pressure cooker, there's no signal, right? So you have actually uh, dark temples that should be created at multiple spots. The only way the dark temple actually manifests is on a network map of a telephone sub uh, service provider. So Airtel on their massive knock will suddenly start seeing big dark temples, big spots of no connectivity on their maps. So we're trying to work on things like this right now. And there's obviously a large manifesto. Legality of dark temple. Okay, so that brings me to uh, I think the last one. This is uh, Heritage Next. So this is something which we started thinking about uh, trying to further some of the pain that, uh, from our initial experiments in Bangra. Um, I'll just quickly flip through some of these. These are actually uh, time capsule in 2010 of what Rangwa uh, I think was in his life. But, uh, we started building on maps from 1610. So these maps, there's no record of these maps obviously, but these are from stories of residents. So there's Father Larry, who was one of the oldest residents in Ranwar. He heard these stories from his grandmother. So these are stories from you know very, very long ago. She was telling us about two villages called Ran and Gaur, which were then uh, sort of uh, separated by this sort of general thing sort of thing. And they over time became large and became larger. So we did our own mapping, we've done some sort of basic treatment. Uh, um, I think up to, uh, so these are some of the engagements with Bandra, like signage, uh, you know, uh, documentation, pedestrian mapping. Uh, these are just identifying significant pedestrian fragments. So at one point we felt that talking about pedestrianization is actually a lot better than talking about heritage conservation because it is avoids you getting shot. So um, this is a heritage walk around Bandra. And uh, where does the heritage next come in? So, uh, so what we felt is that Although there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of stuff to be gained by these, uh, you know, four years into the past, uh, one can actually look at uh, tools of the future to inform uh, our heritage conservation process, right? So this is something we've started off with a partner studio quicksand in uh, Goa, called the Goa Heritage Project. So uh, this looks at uh, tools like photogrammic tools, essentially your cell phone. Uh, you take uh, a lot of pictures of a cell phone, uh, of any kind of object, and you're able to reconstruct it in very, very uh, kind of a good resolution in, uh, as a 3D model. So what we try to do is to document old homes in Goa uh, and move them into virtual reality. Uh, this is a small, uh, this is actually, so you can actually grab photogrammetry uh, uh, sort of data from even YouTube videos. So I'll just uh, show you one of the, so these are some of the icons that have been documented in Goa right now. That's the kind of resolution that you can actually get uh, by doing a good scan. Uh, Photogrammetry actually allows you to reimagine monuments the way they could be or they should be. So you can actually, like there's no hope for this. This is the St. Augustine ruins in Old Goa. Uh, there's no chance that this ever won't be rebuilt, right? Because it's uh, it's a collapsed order of the church. They don't, that order doesn't exist anymore. It's a set for a wedding, uh, for a music festival at best right now. So one can actually reconstruct parts of it in virtual reality. And uh, some of the tools. Uh, we also run a, something called the Edit Lab, which is essentially inviting practicing professionals to Goa. Uh, it's quite easy to invite people to Goa actually. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they come there and chat with us about what their perspectives are. So. And we've been creating this sort of evolving toolkit for action, which is uh, trying to get uh, heritage conservational professionals to engage with a much larger set of toolkits. Like so, uh, using the gypsy kitchen idea, like so one of the tools that came out was actually, say actually, uh, okay, so this type of, yeah. anyway, the idea was to sort of have a meal with the community. That's the first step without even talking about conservation. You actually have a meal, have a drink, have a smoke, whatever it takes you to break that initial ice because uh, a lot of people actually found a lot of residents with tools like this. Um, so these are a larger toolkit which we're hoping to make it open so I can kind of write a little bit about it, uh, put it up, uh, and share it on the future tense and as well. Uh, this is a recent project we're doing with the Museum of Christian Art in Goa. Uh, this actually, I'll just take you through this one because I feel it touches upon many of the things that we spoken about. Uh, we're using drones now to map out. So what we started doing in Bandra by walking each each street to create a pedestrian experience map, which took us around four months of walking. Uh, the drone does in a matter of two days, like so. <laughs> essentially, it's a lot better. 
and there's one guy with a tractor walking on rather than like you know, people with maps and ball pens walking like that. So, anyway, so this is the old Goa complex which we're now trying to uh, document and uh, a lot of the clues to old monuments exist below contours, below, you know, because it's a city that was dismantled by its residents. So it's a very, very interesting history of old Goa. It was the second largest city in Asia at one point. So, uh, and now completely Uh, reimagining artifacts um, and virtual reality tools. So, for example, a heritage walk, the idea of engaging people with heritage in a very, very experienced way can take on a much, much more interesting avatar when you look at virtual reality experiences because uh, right now they're still niche and they kind of, the, the closest you can get is a Google Cardboard, which is the most uh, easy way of disseminating the experiences. But we're trying to still figure out the grammar of this medium and how it can actually become a lucid storytelling tool. Um, photogrammetry documentation of various kind of icons, artifacts, the most storytelling. So this is something we can't go the museum is that take their existing artifacts and place them back in the original context because what happens is in a museum is a very disembodied experience. Like you can see like say a beautiful car, wooden angel, but it's a very different thing to see that wooden angel as part of a fresco on a, you know, uh, as part of an old church. You can see its context, you can see how it responds to the music of that church. And all that can be kind of done very interestingly in virtual reality as well. Uh, so a lot of our current work is in collaboration with Quicksand and we do experiments within building spaces for virtual reality. Uh, this gives you an example of uh, you know just uh, grabbing uh, three-dimensional data off YouTube. And this is actually the uh, the temples in Madurai, but uh, the Binakshi temple complex. But uh, I mean similar sort of uh, environments can be quite easily mapped out uh, in virtual reality as well. This is again a drone that is like hacked video from YouTube, so it's not really our content as well, but it's possible to extract three-dimensional knowledge from a video or a YouTube as well. And we bring some of the Bandra experiments back. So this is a Doll's House project that we have started off in Bandra. The idea is to kind of take uh, documentation of old homes and convert them into small doll houses, which then be retailed to generate money and sales for the uh, and uh, this is right now, so it's like, uh, this is like another, this is some things from what we're doing at NID right now, so this is another batch of exhibition designers. Uh, we're trying to document and, uh, you know, move one of the old lost step wells of Ahmedabad into virtual reality. So, on this Monday, we're going to be flying a drone into step well to kind of, you know, document the whole uh, place through photogrammetry. This is the batch that's working on it. Uh, I mean, the step well is extremely claustrophobic for people who have claustrophobia, so it's the virtual reality is a great way to experiences with all the bats and uh, <laughs> and uh, I think one of the ideas behind this project is to uh, for us for me personally I think it's very interesting to look at virtual reality as an open market. It's uh, it's the tool of our times. So people who are starting to engage with it today are actually people who are going to be the practitioners of 15 to 20 years down the line. So I urge all of you to jump into it in any way possible. The what we're trying to demonstrate through this course is that you don't you do not need any domain knowledge of coding, of technique, of anything you you can be a person who wants to express themselves through poetry. Uh, this is a student called Jessica who is doing crochet in virtual reality. Uh, there is uh, modern making illustration, large scale illustration, poetry, patterns and typography. So it's a very large set of interests and all of these pod really interesting to lead to virtual reality. So we can kind of create a workflow that allows us to generate uh, content for a future medium but not necessarily succumbing to these stereotypes of what a virtual reality film should look like. So because we always get sucked up into this very glossy, fast and the furious kind of a situation where it's really not that. I mean, there's an art house version of virtual reality as well, which is very interesting to explore. That's people kind of drawing in with that. So, yeah, I'll end this. I mean, so maybe just a little bit of, uh, just to sum it up, I feel uh, the idea of future is a spectrum. That's a big one. I think all of us have an individual responsibility to get into the future on our own terms. And, uh, you know, at its, at its best, I think futures are based on futures. Like anyone who calls themselves only a futurist is uh, based on that, basically. Uh, so I feel like all of us need to have our own vision for the future. We need to port ourselves meaningfully into those futures and see how it is that we can, uh, how, how all of us can experience, experience these kind of you know, tech and things. Because one thing to sit on the fringe of it and say it's disruptive and it's going to change everything, but what is it going to change and why is it going to change? All these are questions that are very, very important to ask today. 
and start working in those directions so that it doesn't suddenly slap us in the head or whatever. So all those two on actions are engaging. Uh, I strongly believe that future speculations create optimism. Like uh, working in a current paradigm, both politically, both uh, in terms of principle bylaws. I mean, it's very uh, depressing. I mean, to put it uh, to say it out loud. But I think future speculations have the implicit optimism that's required for designers and data practitioners to actually uh, imbibe as process. Like it's very, very important. Uh, and this sense actually brings out meaningful action in the present as well. It's actually, it's, I mean, no one is saying that one needs to sit in a dark room and visualize pictures and feel happy about it. The point is to actually create a sense of optimism that is residing in a shared future and bring that optimism back into your experience day to day life. Uh, the future is always a provocation because we're not there yet. Uh, we're always trying to say that this is one way it could be. Everyone's visions are valid. Uh, I mean, we've done 10 statues. We'd love it if you guys could do 10 more uh, and for a start this conversation around you know, what a statue could be. And I think together as a group, I mean, we'll have maybe a thousand uh, options for what statues could be like. And one of them reaches someone who could actually build something like that. Uh, that's a great output for a group like this, right? So, uh, and in whatever form, it's not like required for people to do more any kind of renders. It's more important, like, to, you know, externalize like, whatever you feel, what are your tools, what can you do best, how can you engage with these kind of visions and research and techniques and all of that. Um, the future is a constant churn, so I think one should expect unease, expect motion sickness, expect all the things that come with constant churn, and not consider it's going to be a smooth ride and, you know, seamlessly transit, someone else is going to decide all these for us. It's very important for us to be in the driver's seat, put the glasses on, see where we're going, and start charting those paths on our own. And this is very, very important. I feel like uh, in retrospect, if you look back at any revolution, if you look back at any big societal change, it started the smallest ways. It's always been in one conversation in a living room, and eight people got together and burned one statue, and that became Burning Man today. Right? So, I mean, these are very small effects in the present, which we feel where is going to play out, but in the future, looking backwards, uh, anyone who's at the end of these movements looking back and saying, man, I, I never thought that could happen. So like, it's super important to also realize that any small action today, any incremental step, externalizing, talking, putting it out, is always a big step for the future. Thank you. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that was a quick one, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think the the fun part for me personally was to kind of start the dialogue with you guys. So I mean, any kind of questions, uh, and actually the reason why we're all here. So this is the setting for it. <laughs> so we get to chat with you guys. Oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> or like post coffee meeting. <laughs>
mostly actually you know, I mean it works in multiple levels. One is that you could create an environment or a scenario for humans to inhabit. And uh, because I feel like uh, the madness of future is really interesting for me personally. Like, I feel like uh, it's one thing to say that we want to live in these kind of cities and you have renditions of the city from a elevation perspective with some reflection and you know it's like it's very sanitized uh, view. And it's uh, it's not the way it exists. Like on all our future city proposals and visualization, we don't have anything for it. Like, there's no 400 year old monument. Like, you don't see Victoria Terminus in any of those cities, which is it's a travesty. Like, I mean, we've been sold the vision that doesn't exist. Uh, so, I feel like the inclusiveness of the visualization itself is a very, very key tool to get people to be participated. Like, uh, one really stupid thing happened actually. So, we were part of this coastal road, uh, you know, I mean, not actually, but like, it's all the people are just thinking about how stupid it is to put so much money into a Project that's going to service, I think, 5 or 6 percent of Bombay's uh, population. There's 53 percent of Bombay's pedestrians. And there's no amount of money going to the pedestrian upgrade. It's all going to vehicle upgrade, which is uh, a fraction of the city that's using that interest. And so, all of us kind of decided to pull in resources like the Bandra Collective form around that, the six other architects of studios. And we said, let's do these dystopic kind of, you know, visualization of how Ajay is going to change with all these intersections and all that. Once those visualizations came out in media, we realized that everyone's like amazed by it. Like, wow, man, Jacobi was now, that's amazing. So I think people don't really get sarcasm as much. Like I feel like uh, it really, uh, and that's actually a problem, right? Because when you put out something that's supposed to be a provocation, it gets seen as a new good. Uh, like how many people actually find that BKC is a great place? So how many people find that Gurgaon is like the you know, next year of Sarah? Like, uh, what if one has to create an interesting conversation about this, there is Deva Asura thing has to happen. Like you have to actually engage with the other and see who the people who are completely unlike you and then start a conversation with them. Like, because then there's, like that's why a lot of people like talking to cabbies. You know, like uh, just ask some political questions and sit back and listen. Like, you know, and that's the, I mean that's the essence of the New York experience. Also, like, it's one of those things that you get to engage with the other. Like, so, I mean that, that's all about people. I mean, any kind of visualization conversation of that kind, there's all this open like human to human interactions. I don't know the answer to this. <laughs> Let that snowball into the next battle, right? So, 
don't pick on something like I want to save all the tigers by tomorrow. Like that's not what happened. Like, you know, so select a small part of whatever you feel comes from within you, and that's the first step. Like part of something you can do. Right? And have a quick win associated with that. Uh, that gathers support. It gathers momentum. Maybe like, someone else will see your thing and say, so, yeah, I want to get involved in that. So that's how it sort of starts. It's like a great thing about forums like this, right? Because uh, they're all aggregators. I mean, it's getting people together who are thinking about similar things and they're able to now share processes and share insights. But I think other yeah, things come out of it. I mean, uh, the technology is something you see in your own. Uh, because these are large changes. You know, there are societal changes that take three, four generations to happen. But that doesn't uh, create a sense of hopelessness. It creates a sense of optimism that you know, you're part of a long race and you pass the page on to someone who can take it further. Do you want to take a bit of run back? Do you see like a strong conversation happening now? Absolutely. I mean, the WhatsApp groups like from the first lab are still active. People still sharing stuff around and you know, people have maybe not even involved us, but they've created their own networks. Because they try to keep it as inclusive as possible. So there's also big money represented on that group. There's, uh, you know, for example, Asian people who sponsor them. They have representation on that group as well. So we can stop it becoming only about activism and fully left-leaning people saying that, you know, everything is for Like, saying, okay, there is public investment, there is ethical companies also involved in this conversation. How do, how do you get the best of everything? Uh, something. So, part of the Museum of Christian Art project is actually based on this uh, collaborative thing. They're collaborating with Narcotec for Nando, who's Goa-based, who's very heavy set guys, and uh, the history of work class. We're supporting him with futures and future kind of things. We are documentation of all the artifacts of the church. What's really interesting as a spin-off of that project is we try to create a digital repatriation project. Right? So like, are you familiar with repatriation? So I feel like all of us should be like really, really pissed off about anything. Right? So uh, there's one thing is that you know, obviously the, say the British Museum in London has a lot of Indian artifacts. Probably some ways is a good thing because we probably have like destroyed them or like squandered <laughs> away or whatever. At least they're safe there. But digitally you can get them back. Right, so there's a way of two photogrammetry for these progressive media that can document it, document the stories around it and have it consumable by a much larger audience than the people who can actually travel to the UK and see them. So there's, uh, from private collections, like the people who own these amazing artifacts in private collections, they could be incentivized to give digital rights to a museum, not the actual object. The object actually gains in value by getting more people to look at it, but not damage it in any way. So a VR tool, it would be a really interesting repatriation vehicle. Right? So we can prototype that in work works, but if that works, you can make that format available to any museum in the world. And say that if you're all about natural history, reach out to every single uh, person who can make their personal collection accessible to you and be talking to them via like that. Uh, it's a first step. I'm not saying that that's the way it should be. Like everyone sitting in the other class and missing museum in the world. But I mean, it's a uh, little more of storytelling. There are different projects that come out of it. I mean, all of us are application oriented people. I mean, we're not happy to sit in our lab and only do research, right? But we fight that application thing. You don't really fight it because sometimes you, you have an idea of the idea of the idea of the idea But you see the idea of what it is. It's a provocation. Put it out there, let it be, let it be able to see the responses you get to it. Create an inclusive process around those responses. Respond to people's fears, queries, all of that. Like, I mean, the whole Kastupa that we take, for example, the massive thing of this. You know, why are all our statues made? You know, it's very weird to you to me. Like, I didn't realize that we were doing it, but you realize that for some reason there's some inherent bias that's making us think that way. Right? And then you kind of become a better human being at the same time. I
like a green ball in their own flower. So there is like more of something. Those ideas can be proposed to the builders basically that can help in the near future because you are not able to stop the buildings which are coming up sure. like a So, so this is a super layer question. I mean, uh, uh, and again, I think I would actually uh, address that in isolation. Like, there's no one single policy decision that you can make that's going to suddenly change the city for the first. It's never going to be that. Right. I mean, you have to imagine it's not a 200 year cycle. In Bombay, what's going to be like in 200 years, and how do you create small steps? So, uh, what's happened to say Detroit, right? So, interesting example. Detroit was a city built on automobiles. Like, it's essentially the place where America saw its uh, massive assembly lines and you know, automobile culture starting. After that is actually capped out and people are actually, you know, now decentralized in terms of production. Therefore, it is moving into gardening. So it's a city that's going from automobile reliance to urban gardening and creating the sense of community around the place. It was basically the vacuum. Like Detroit is now shrinking. So it's part of that waveform that you know has this big boom. Now sort of downturn in terms of size. But in terms of one-to-one -one interactions, in terms of health, in terms of any other metric that you put on a city as apart from the main growth. You know, big building cap or metric. It's actually a healthier city today. So, you know, I mean, if you consider Bombay as a waveform and what you want to tweak in that waveform, like, right? so I think there is merit in going vertical for sure, where the land starves, there's no place to, you have to go vertical, there's no other option. Uh, but I feel that, it's like, again, multiple dimensions, I feel like nature needs to work a lot harder in the city complex. You cannot imagine having big public parks. Uh, it's, in some sense, I feel like you're putting a lot less pressure on nature to work harder to be in a city. And I don't mean there's any creepy way. I feel like, you no, know, for example, if you like, can like, imagine a whole vertical farm in a city, right? So you can imagine one of the towers dedicated by the city to actually be an urban farm within, say, a parade district where people actually uh, are doing that. Uh, there's also a large amount of uh, uh, bylaws and policy decisions that need to be in place because. Uh, in fact, part of the group, that we had a very similar question that came up in the last lab. And uh, once you study bylaws, like, so Sami Padora's office has done some really amazing work in this. They've studied the, uh, the bylaws of Bombay. And they put out like, this really amazing publication on housing, uh, which you should definitely look at if you're interested. But uh, they've actually made the entire development plan visible, you know, saying that this is what the typology is, that the publicity is, and this is how. And within that, they've suggested many interesting things to actually retrofit. You know, pedestrian experience is a big one. So when you're on a street, you need to have a one-to-one -one, uh, pedestrian experience with the architecture. Like what's happening, the worst part is that the bottom five or six floors of the podium architecture kind of paradigm is given to parking. So what happens is that the six floors of the building is completely inactive. Like there's no people, there's no, no one shouting, no one keeping an eye on the street at night. Uh, uh, Jane Jacobs is an amazing person to read with this in pedestrian building because she talks about safety. Uh, shorter blocks so that the city becomes navigatable on foot. You know, you're not constantly relying on an automobile uh, pedestrian upgrade. So it's nuances, like huge amounts of small experiments. And if it's something that you're passionate about, you should, you know, see within your toolkit what is it that you can do and start a small experiment. You know, that's the only way you actually want to get feedback from whether it's actually working or not. And different pieces demand different things. Like, I mean, Bandra is easy because, you know, there's already ALMs and everyone's really in love with the suburb anyway. Like it's very hard to do in Andheri where you know, it's mostly you know, people are from outside Bombay, they're not really there for three generations, four generations. So not that invested in the city, for example. But how do you create local pride? How do you create like resident pride? How do you, you know, set people to walk more and drive less? All these things are steps towards a, a better future. And even actually, even 50 years down the line, 100 years down the line, wherever you push your slider in terms of future, that's not going to be utopia. That's still going to be a work in progress. That's still that churn is going to be happening then also. So, you know, it's just the, I think that the framing is different, like problem solution framing is very, very problematic. Like it's not, uh, there is no, would be no perfect solution, right? but it's still our duty to have an iterative step in that area. To feel more green, you know, get behind it, find out who the seed banks are, uh, what are your local species, they don't transfer random shit from Madeira to Mumbai, like, I mean, they're all very invasive species, right? Whether like Lantana or something crazy, it's like taking over all the whole of India, man. You think about that kind of that. Uh, they, they planted from hedges with a morning and got like beautiful orange and yellow flowers. It's the most invasive plant in the, in the world right now. Like, its roots grow like crazy deep, you can't pull it out, it will burn the whole thing.
इतना पैसा तो जाने वाला तो पेंट का हाउस तो वो तो ऐसे बना पीस तो बना ओल्ड कॉपरी पैसे भी कम ना हो सो देस अ वेरी सेंस ऑफ चेंज इज हैपनिंग ऑलरेडी एंड एट दैट टाइम इट्स नाइस टू स्लिप इन एंड ऑफ इट सो इफ ऑन एवरी प्लान फॉर दोस काइंड ऑफ इवेंट्स लाइक व्हाट्स दैट फेस्टिवल इन इज इट अराउंड ट्राइंगल इज इट अराउंड यू नो द प्राइड फेस्टिवल वेयर यू एक्चुअली एंड हाउ कैन यू स्लिप इट इन लाइक यू नो से वी वांट टू मेक द टेरेस सेफ फॉर पीपल टू जंप अक्रॉस द चेसिंग काइंड्स राइट एंड दैट्स अ होल प्रोजेक्ट इन मोबिलिटी But uh, it can be done from a home-to-home basis without it being like just top-down government saying it's not really done with the idea. So I think uh, in that sense, for me, like personally, I think creating toolkits is a lot more satisfying because you're able to give people option and agency. Like this top-down thing never really works. Like you dedicate a fit area that's heritage. No one wants that tag because it's actually curbing their development rights. And as a fundamental right of a landowner, you can't do that. I mean, you can't like say that you know you have to live in squalor, you have to live in All that are crumbling and you know sucking up water from the ground on a daily basis. You put your kids at health risk. You get bronchitis. I don't know what, but you have to live in this home. So that's what I actually say. So all these are like you know someone has the resources to live in that home and refurbish it and live there. Even for sure, okay. Uh, so I feel like if people are deciding for themselves at a home level, then the precinct also starts becoming a lot healthier. And this is what you see as a sign of health in most uh, you know well. And the active districts and also uh, stops gentrification to a large extent because we have farmers coexisting with people living in a very healthy community of people who are residents at the same time also welcoming of other visitors because they're not you know identity tussle like you see this a lot it's like this sort of I think the wild wild country is all in May class and you know like I'm your first so I have rights but people come later like I mean I would say like for for me for example half the guys I met in Goa like I'm more invested in Goa than them but I've been there for two years. You know, like they've been over four generations, but they don't know about the past. They don't know about how much. Right? So the, the sense of agency, like who's actually going to be concerned, who's going to do what, that also becomes very interesting to explore as a sense of identity. Like right? I don't, in my head, I don't think of myself as a boy, but I'm heavily invested in that. So, uh, so you know, these kind of lines are drawn very harshly in current sense. So, like, any kind of boundary condition can be blurred. You know, like it's uh, like food blurs boundary. Music blurs boundaries. So I feel like looking for solutions outside architecture is actually a lot more enabling. You need to understand the grammar of what works there and apply it to structure. Uh, like this move from uh, private to public is a huge one. It's going to be like because our private, our, our public spaces are shrinking and being taken away from us on a daily basis. So any kind of if people are willing to contribute to two feet of their compound work for public space and urban gardening. Like massive shifts, no? Like some of the better space buildings are created, say for people are more interested, like you know, big team, all of that. So, no easy answer. Activity is still here, so that 
And uh, this can become very dystopic, like in Japan, for example, there are documented cases of people not leaving their rooms for 45 days, right? Sitting in a room, plugged into uh, a headset playing network games. They get pizza delivered. Uh, they've got slots in their doors so that pizza can be spread inside without any disruption in gaming. Uh, you know, so it's like a very dystopic matrix kind of situation. Like, uh, people plugged into the machine and just like living this crazy life. So, uh, so that's not where we want to go as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure actually like, we'll have those crazy people in India as well. Like I'm sure there's like a whole bunch of like pissed off people who want to just live in a room and uh, you know live out their like the Dubai Sheikh fantasy, whatever it is they're doing in virtual reality, which is fine. Uh, but like people who are actually more invested in the actual terrain want to build stuff on the ground that want to upgrade. Reality in that sense, like there's enough learnings from the future provocations to pull back into uh, reality. Like, so, so I, I feel like that statues one, for example, it could be a retrofit also. You don't need to make new statues. Uh, you could actually retrofit solar panels onto existing statues. You could do so much with public space that's already uh, in the public domain. 